All right, welcome to your first lecture video of the semester. There are going to be a lot of these, um, primarily because I'm going to try and keep them relatively short, try to target under 20 minutes. We'll see how successful we are um, as we get going through. Um, your goal with watching these videos should be to treat this as you're sitting, excuse me, sitting in the classroom. Okay, so you want to have a notebook out, you want to have note paper out, and you want to take notes just as you would if you were sitting in front of me in the classroom, okay? Because that's how I'm going to approach delivering these lectures. Um, so our chapter one is uh, all about classifications of matter, okay? So we're going to be primarily focused on atoms and elements as things that we are focusing on. Um, I tend to repeat myself. Don't worry about it. Also, I apologize for my handwriting. It sometimes gets a little bit weird. Uh, but hopefully you're able to decipher the hieroglyphics. Um, currently, IUPAC recognizes um, about 112 elements, okay? Um, 90 of those are natural, right? I think that number might be 113 or 114 now. Um, IUPAC does funny things with... Um, recognizing newly created, uh, newly, not just created, but um, new elements. Um, there are 118 on the periodic table, um, but not all of them have actual names yet. So in case you're wondering, IUPAC stands for the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemists, and that is sort of the governing body of the chemistry world. They decide what we call things, how we deal with things, um, that sort of thing. So. We have around 112 recognized elements, 90 of those are natural, so the rest were man-made. Right, so elements are the simplest. Simplest forms of matter, okay? Meaning that they cannot be broken down by chemical means. Okay, and that's the important part. So we've all read and heard about atom smashers and the big hadron collider and things like that where they smash things into each other and they get bits and parts that are smaller than elements and atoms. Um, but by chemical means, an element is the simplest form of matter, okay? Because we cannot break things down further by chemical means, okay? Compounds. are made up of elements. Okay? And usually we're talking about things that are two or more different elements. Okay? So compounds because they're made of two or more different elements, they can be broken down into simpler parts. Mixtures, okay, so elements, compounds, now if we start taking things and putting them together in different proportions, mixtures can vary in composition. Okay, so, um, and we have two different kinds of mixtures that we need to be able to differentiate between. So one is called a homogeneous mixture. And homo being the important part, homo means same. Okay, so homogeneous mixtures are often also referred to as solutions. Okay, and the defining characteristic of a homogeneous mixture is it has the same composition throughout. Okay. So to sort of put that in a, in a visual perspective, if I have a beaker, and I 
it's a terrible beaker, but you get the get the point. And let's say in my beaker, I've got water and salt, NaCl. Okay, that forms a homogeneous mixture. And what that what that means is that if I take a sample from right here or a sample from right here, they should be identical to each other. Okay, so it doesn't matter where I take a take a sample of that solution. If it's homogeneous, those two samples will be identical. Okay, so they have the same composition throughout. All right, Ex other examples of uh, homogeneous mixtures solutions are things like a sugar solution, air, uh, salt water, which we have right there, or gasoline. Okay. The other type of mixture that we have, instead of uh, homo, we have hetero. A heterogeneous mixture varies in composition. Okay. So if I have, say for example, a beaker of a mixture of oil and water, right, what I'm going to have is water and oil, right? If I take a sample from here and a sample from here, they'll be different, okay? Even if I were to shake that up, right, I can, I can force those, those that water and the oil to sort of mix like in a salad dressing, right? Um, they're still gonna have areas where you have a different amount of oil and a different amount of water, right? Other examples, um, one of my favorites are chocolate chip cookies, right? So to give you an idea, you've got your chocolate chunks in your chocolate chip cookie. If I take a sample from right here or a sample from right here, I'm gonna have differing amounts of stuff, okay? Other types of examples, a mixture of sand and water, concrete, milk, believe it or not, all right? You may say, but milk's all white. Well, if you take a sample of, of milk from one spot and a sample of milk from another spot, you're going to have differing amounts of milk fat, um, the casein fats and the different... Um, lactose and things like that. Um, salad dressings. Okay, these are all examples of heterogeneous mixtures. All right, so let's talk about um, in our next sort of topic here, um, different states of matter. And there are something like five or six recognized states of matter. For the purposes of this class, we're gonna focus on the three most basic, solids, liquids, and gases, okay? So also included in there would be things like plasma, right? Um, but that's sort of more in a physics field than, than what we're gonna deal with. So characteristics of solids. So solids have defined volume and shape. Right? And the reason for that is that the atoms and molecules are locked in place. Right? So the atoms and molecules, we call this a crystal structure. Now the atoms and molecules, they can vibrate where they are. Okay, and that's what happens when you heat something up. As you add heat energy into a solid, the reason that it gets hot is because the atoms and molecules start to vibrate about their, their positions. They're not moving around, but as long as that thing stays solid, those atoms and molecules stay put and they vibrate and they create heat. Okay, so liquids have defined volume
but indefinite shape. Okay. In other words, they take the shape of whatever container they are in. Right? And the reason for that is that the atoms and molecules stay touching but can move. They can slide past each other. Okay, so in a liquid, you've got everything still touching each other. All those molecules are still in physical contact with one another, but the forces holding them in place are weaker than they are in solids. And so they are actually able to slide past and move and change shape. But the fact that they're still touching is what, may, uh, what keeps it as a defined volume. Okay, so our last one is gases. Gases, um, the atoms and molecules are free to move about, so indefinite shape and volume. Okay, the atoms and molecules can move in any direction. Because there is space between them. Say space between the particles, right? So because there is space between the particles, that gives us the ability to take some particles and push them closer together, okay? So one particularly defining characteristic of gases is that they are compressible. Right? And that may not be how you spell compressible. I think there's two S's. Um, but that is the only, so gases are the only compressible states of matter. Okay, it's not physically possible to compress a liquid. It's not complete, uh, actually possible to compress a solid because the atoms and molecules are locked in place. Right? If you take a solid and you compact it tight enough, it actually becomes something new, right? sort of like um, lumps of coal becoming diamonds. Okay? Liquids, the fact that hydraulics work is proof that liquids are not compressible. If you squeeze a liquid, it has to go somewhere, and we can use that to do work in things like machinery. Okay? So, in an effort to keep these videos relatively short and sweet, I'm going to stop this video right here, and we'll pick it up um, on the next video with talking about measurements of matter.